tonight. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it's going to be fun. Um, and I'd like to introduce, I'd like to raise your hand when I introduce you. If these don't be easy, find audience people don't know who you are. So Peggy Crow Roberts. Yeah. And her, hu her husband, Ray Roberts. Yeah. Gil Dellinger. Yeah. Shelby Keefe. Yeah. And Mike Hernandez. Yeah. All right. So these are our fine group of people that I don't think they volunteered for this. <laughs> Did you volunteer for this? Well, I kind of asked them, and they didn't want to say no to me. So. <laughs> if Rosemary asked you to, you did not volunteer for this. <laughs> you were coerced. But anyway, we're happy to have you here, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy, busy week. This is an incredible week for these people. I mean, if you know what these people are doing, sun up till way into the middle of the night for some people. I mean, they're painting nocturnes. Some of them are probably out there right now doing this. Um, it's just amazing what these people do in, in the course of a, just a few days, really, when you think about it. And, and so thank you for taking the time out to be with us this evening and, and allowing me to ask you some very, well, what I like to think are interesting questions, but you tell me if they're interesting or not. The mic goes both ways, by the way. It's fine. <laughs> the first mic. Sorry? We're on live mic. You have a mic. In oh, fact, no. pass this down. Mr. Yeah. Dillinger's going to be the first one. <laughs> Gail, you're the first one in the hot seat here, so have a good time. Don't say that about her. <laughs> All right. The first question that I have for you, and I, I would just like to say we're going to do this fairly, you know, fairly freely and easily. Just pass the mic down to the next person. Uh, if they don't want to say anything, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, this is, this is for us to get to know each other a little bit and to really kind of understand a little bit what makes you whom you are and why you do what you do. So the first question I have is, what was the first time you realized you wanted to be artistic? Not an artist, but artistic. I had no idea, honestly. I, uh, put, put the mic close to you. My, it's a microphone. <laughs> it's very dangerous feedback. to give me a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I might start singing, breaking the song. Uh, I, I took a, a drawing class in college at 24. I was 24 before I ever did my first drawing. So it, I didn't know, uh, and, it, and it was a struggle, still has been off and on, but I wasn't one of those gifted young people. Yeah, most of them are just so good. And it took me a long time to realize how bad I was. <laughs> um, but anyway, 20, I was 24. 24? Yeah. Okay. And I never said anything in the locker room about that. <laughs> 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 I see some Trump supporters scowling at me. <laughs> yeah, where's Julian Assange when you need him, right? <laughs> Is it on? It's yeah. on. Yeah. Your life. I was five. Uh -uh. Ooh. Uh, well, yeah, I think for me it was because I came from a family of uh, artists. Basically, my mom's side, uh, grandma was an artist, and grandma and grandpa were always bringing some cool thing to make, to 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 draw, to create with, and. All I ever wanted to do was draw and make stuff. Mm -hmm. That's all I ever wanted to do. The other stuff was just, you know, not exciting and not interesting to me. And so um, being able to, well, having materials <coughs> provided and encouraged to be playing with and, and making stuff was, was a, a family thing, family tradition. And I do come from a... Um, a family of crafters too. We always make stuff, even to this day. You know, if we're sitting around, we're making stuff. We're, I don't know. Where, where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you come from? I'm I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. So you know, we're upper Midwest, and it's cold, and you got to do something in the winter time, <laughs> and we just like to to create and and I guess I I don't really know a time when I didn't want to to be creative. Because uh, even as a kid, uh, we made stuff outside. You know, we made forts. 
with sticks and gunny sacks and whatever we could find to make little houses and, and create and, you know, I mean, kids do that anyway. Kids are all naturally artists, I think. They're all, all artists. So it's just what they choose to move ahead with and how well encouraged they are. And I think that's part of why a lot of people who are innately driven kind of stop because maybe they weren't encouraged. And, uh, and that's why it's great to have teachers to say, yes, you can do this and it's okay. And you don't have to make a living at it right away. How about let's just have some fun? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's the very long story. Mm -hmm. hey, Mike, your turn. Um, I don't remember how old I was, but um, my father was uh, an artist for Northrop Grumman, so he had a studio at home, a little office. When he wasn't there, you know, when he was there, I would spy on what he was doing with <laughs> markers and, and uh, pencils and whatnot, but uh, when he wasn't there, I would sneak into his office and steal the markers, steal the, <laughs> the pencils, and he would come home and, you know, scream at me. Uh, but I knew something was going on, and the, I think the teachers did. Um, when the PG folders started turning into art assignments and my wooden desks at school, you know, I started engraving into the surface. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started skipping, you know, anything and everything that was mathematics on the side of the paper. There were drawings and noodles and whatnot. I, I never thought of, I, I loved expression, and I think for me, I never thought of it as art, but I just always figured it was a part of my grammar and my vocabulary, and this is how I speak, you know, and this is not necessarily how, how I speak to other people, but this is how I get to know myself. Um, so it was a form of grammar for me, and it came off as rebellious when I was younger, and I never thought of it as um, something I'd want to make a living at, even in high school. Never thought of it as something I wanted to make a living at doing. I just figured this is expression, this is me, this is what I do. Um, so, it, it, again, it was always thought of as rebellious, I think, until um, after high school I decided I, I, I thought I'd Figured, you know, I was doing enough of this, getting in trouble with it, so I might as well make a living at it, and that's when I decided to go to art school and do something with it. Very good. All right, the Roberts. Mm -hmm. You can take turns at this one. <laughs> well, if I understood the question correctly, not when I decided to become an artist, when I became artistic. Artistic, All right, because there's a follow-up to this that's coming up. Well, those are two very different things. Correct. Uh, but I'd like to answer them both. When I decided to become an artist was third grade. But when I decided to become artistic was about six years ago. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, right. Do you want me to hand the microphone back to her? <laughs> Can you expand upon that? Yeah, expand upon that, please, Peggy. You might as well just drop it and watch Just uh, an, an immense confusion has come over me the past six years. Uh, I've always wanted to be an artist. I'll, I'll always continue. But to be artistic is to really reach in and... Uh, answer everything that is uh, confounding you, um, calling you, and I'd say it's become. Um, I can't escape it. I can't. I can't not address it. it. You know, it really has escalated every day, starting about six years ago. Mm. So, and I'm 62. So. Been an artist that long, and I hope to become artistic. Why at fifty-six? Uh, I, 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 uh, I didn't have the restlessness or the um, the searching. The searching um, has become immense. The restlessness has become. Um, I can't. I'm just struggling to to solve it and reach it. Okay, Jay Strodkamp is a registered wait, 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 therapist, wait, wait, and he's sitting in the <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Ray, you're, you're in the hot seat now, buddy. Come on. 
you all heard of uh, Timothy Leary? Yeah. <laughs> it had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, I, I think of Shelby. Oh, well, all, a lot of us. I, when I was a kid, five years old, six years old, and had the box of crayons. And, and um, I didn't realize at the time that doing a drawing of the mailman would be controversial in our family. <laughs> <laughs> since I was a kid, just loved crayons. <laughs> so that's when I became artistic. Well, I'm going to follow this up with the next question. When did you decide to become a professional artist? Uh, uh, that's a leap of faith, right? Yeah, it was, it was in college. Uh, I had a split major of advertising and illustration. And... Uh, they had the art director from Mattel come in and tell us, I, I couldn't decide, I knew I could make money in advertising and I didn't, I wasn't very self-confident about illustration, but the the art director from Mattel came in and taught, taught, talked to our class and told us how much money we could make <laughs> working on Barbie ads. Whoa! <laughs> that's, okay, that's now does that have anything to do with that mailman that you drew? <laughs> <back here? laughs> Funny you should bring that up. <laughs> uh, I, uh, and, and since then, I, I, I went into illustration. Of course, I had a lot of catching up to do. And I tell this story in my workshop and that I had to start off, start lower on the, on the ladder than a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of my fellow students in that I had to do a lot of black and white illustrations for newspapers, which really reinforced, uh, they gave me a, a, a good foundation and values. For, for pain, so it was a very, it was a humble beginning, but it, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I had to start, start lower than, than my, my fellow classmates. So P Peggy, uh, while you're, we well, got the mic over there, y you said that you are now becoming artistic just six years ago, but you decided to become a professional artist way before that, and, and what High was school. that? High school. Okay, mm -hmm. and why? Uh, well, my mother was a very in-demand fashion illustrator, and she'd always encouraged us four kids that we could, you know, it was um, a viable occupation, and that you could have a family and be an artist. And I saw her make a living and do these wonderful ads and drawings and, and then go on to paint, and so she was very encouraging and I just kind of never ever thought that you can't do that professionally. I always just kind of knew you could do that or be a dentist or or whatever. Okay, fair enough. Gil? Well, I, I wanted to amend what I said because I really did, when I first got to college, took a couple of classes which I subsequently failed but they were um, drawing and de designing color. And I failed because I wasn't, I wasn't uh, diligent enough. <clears throat> so when I finally returned to it, with some discipline, <clears throat> I think uh, I, I had enough foundation that I could, I could, I could pursue it. But when I told my father <clears throat> I wanted to be an artist, he, he lived in San Mateo at the time, and I, I remember the whole earth shook uh, between uh, San Mateo and, and San Francisco. <laughs> it was like an earthquake. And he said, what? <laughs> and I won't tell you the rest that he said, but it was complimentary to artists. So, um, and, and what was the question? I'm sorry, I was drifting. <laughs> It was a follow-up question. That, uh, when did you realize that you wanted to become a professional oh, okay. artist? So, Make a living at it. Um, I, I, when I went to undergraduate school, I, I decided I wanted to do it, and I wanted a master's degree, and I wanted to teach, and I wanted to paint. Okay. And um, that was uh, 1970. 1970. So um, I'm immediately started pushing in that direction. And I, 
I, for 50 years, I've, I've, I've been working 8 to 10 hours a day for the most part. I take Sunday off. But I, I love it still. You know, when I get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to be happy to go in my studio. Um, or to get out. Tomorrow I'll get out. But um, having the privilege of being with uh, people like uh, Peggy and Ray, as we began to, um, this, this movement began to emerge, I think solidified my desire to be really successful as I could. <coughs> And I had so many students over the years who could, who could outdraw me. Mm -hmm. uh, fabulous people, as I taught at the University of Pacific in the art department. But um, none of them could outwork me, and I think that that has to be a key for all of us. That you just, you just get in there. And so for 50 years, I've been um, busy destroying marriages and making my kids angry at me. But I'm still <laughs> painting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Shelby, anything you want to add to this? Uh, I think it's kind of a similar story, um, but I, I knew even as a little kid I wanted to make a living as an artist. I wasn't sure how that was going to look, but I knew back then, I was growing up in the 60s, um, I knew back then that what they called commercial art was what it was I was going to have to do to make a living as an artist. Right. So um, I, I went to uh, art school, but it was actually a, a um, you know, whatever they call that, those where you have to take math to <laughs> and history <laughs> and all that other stuff. What do they call those art schools? School. No, I was saying. <laughs> Liberal arts. arts, thank you. Math um, for artists. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> um, so basically, I, I just figured out how to, even though I didn't have any classes in commercial art because they, that, they didn't teach that then, uh, I knew I just had to get out there and, and do projects. And I ended up getting graphic design jobs. So I was a graphic designer for 26 years. Okay. Uh, Self-employed for the last probably 10 of that. Which helps, you know, sure. being self-employed helps your self being uh, self-employed fine artist as well. Yeah. So and that's great for the ego if you're actually getting paid to do what you're doing, right? It it <laughs> doesn't hurt. It helps. It helps. Yeah. But I had a dad who was like, "You want to be an artist? You want to make a living at that? Prove it." <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't as vocal though. Oh. He he. But he was a silent. He was the strong silent type. But my mom was the one with the art in the family and, and uh, they still let me you know, go to art school and I was going to prove to him that I could do this thing and I did, thank goodness and now he's astounded that I can make money on paintings you made that on what? Are you really? do you need a representative? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it gratifying though when you actually can prove that to your parents and say yeah I made it you know, and, and that's that's interesting because, you know, there are a lot of artists that, unfortunately, they become, later in life, they became more known, and parents are no longer around, and they've never had a chance to really be able to bask in that little bit of glory, mm -hmm. and so it's for, very fortunate for you to be able to do that. And my parents are still with me, too. They're 80, 81, so they're still around. Bravo. Yeah. 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 Okay, my friend, Mike. Um, well, growing up the son of, uh, um, uh, you know, my father working in the industry as an artist, you know, uh, my brother and I always thought at some point we were going to do something with art. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, after high school, it was more of a hobby for us. It was expression, like I said. Um, I remember losing sight after high school. I, I, I'd gone to a um, public college and, and, and started taking some of my... Um, uh, um, prerequisites and whatnot and getting my AA uh, before I get into art school and then at some point I lost sight of it um, and uh, started working for a cable company and I was a cable auditor one of the guys would you know go and search for cable theft and, uh, <laughs> cable what cable theft theft, theft. Of, cable. of cable stealing cable yeah oh, right <laughs> copper or, or just uh, for the metals or what was the deal? no they were just trying no. to steal the actual I mean they would sell boxes to people Oh, and they would go and climb up their phone poles or go into the boxes of the units and they would give them free cable. 
So our job oh, was to go kind of yeah. <laughs> cable TV. Right, right. Hey, you want the all? You want all the channels? I'll give them to you. And then, that was my job. My job was to go. But you know, for me, I did it just to make money. And then I thought to myself, eventually, I'll, I'll go to art school because I know it was expensive. Uh, but after about two to three years of doing that, I think uh, I started thinking to myself, well, you know, I can make a career out of this. And, and, I, and I know that, you know, uh, the woman I was dating at the time, I thought, okay, marriage is right around the bend. I guess I should start making a career out of this. And I, I figured I can do this. I can make 40 to 60 grand a year. I can move up to being a manager at the cable company. And uh, so, <laughs> lost sight of the art. I figured, well, the art is always going to be a hobby. I'll always have that to do on the sides, and I can play with that. And, you know, maybe, you know when there's weddings, I could do their portraits, and it would be fun. Um, but I, I, so my job involved, you know, some somewhere between, you know, 20 and 60 poles, climbing these 90 foot poles every day to go up and then check to see if there was theft. And I loved it. It kept me in shape. Uh, um, it was a, for me, it was great. Um, uh, but I remember one one particular day, I was in the city of Torrance, and I was climbing up. We were in these gaps. There's little blades, and they barely go into the wood at all. And there's gapping up this pole, and then somewhere in there, the the wood chipped out. And I was about 80 feet up, and I remember just about ready to fall and holding on to a wire. Uh, and I'm dangling and dangling, and my guy down below, he really couldn't see me or hear me, and I had to just kind of grab my belt and lift over, and I, I pretty much almost lost my life at that moment. And I remember clipping myself in and then catching my breath and realizing, I'm supposed to be an artist. <laughs> uh, so the light goes on. The light went on. <laughs> Shift change. Shift change. Art came back, got into school, and then artist from there. <laughs> That's a good Not one. Not many of us have that kind of an electrifying... <laughs> All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue right into one of my favorite questions. And, and actually, there's two coming up here. But what was your most inspiring moment in your artistic career? Um... I think the most inspiring moment was when my, I have a 10 year old son, and when he was seven, um, he wanted to paint with me. And I thought, you know, wow, that was, for me, that was a very inspiring moment because, you know, that isn't often that your son, you know, wants to sit with you and reflect with you and do the things that you want to do. Um, and we sat together, but my son is really stubborn. He's a stubborn <laughs> kid. He doesn't want you to touch his painting, he doesn't want you to paint with him. Uh, or, or paint on his painting, but he wants to sit back to back with me. And, and um, so I remember we were in Yosemite and we were painting back to back in the valley. And um, he was asking me, Daddy, what color do you use for the shadow? And I would just tell him, I use this color with this and I put a little bit of white. Great. Daddy, what color do you use for the sky? Daddy, what color this? And so we're just talking back to back. Uh, and then when we were done, um, I was just shocked, you know, when he showed me what he painted. Things I could never imagine my students would ever paint on their first try, wow. or I would at his age, you know, okay. at seven years old. And was that the first time that he produced a painting like that? That was, he had done other paintings, but plain air like this, yeah. I mean, he did a painting, um, uh, and it was because of that painting that I opened up his own little Facebook page for him, um, because it shocked me. I mean, it shocked me that he, he did that well, and I can see traces of who I was in his work, you know, looking at... My, my, the colors and the tendencies to mix in certain ways and use light or simplify, things that took me years uh, to do, he was just doing it. Um, and that inspired me. I mean, that was one of the biggest inspirations I had. It's like, wow, you know, things that, you know, people tend to take for granted. My son is able to do this at his age. And I thought to myself, you know, how do I return back to the simplicity of a child? Because I think a lot of the solutions are in the simplicity. And I think a lot of the problems we create for ourselves as an adult, you know, we make it harder than it should be. We overcomplicate. We overcomplicate it. And I looked at what my son did, and I was, I mean, to me, that was one of the most inspiring moments, you know, as a How painter. old is he now? He's 10. Okay. Yeah. And is he still doing it? No. Like, <laughs> no. He was kind of showing me, it's just like, Daddy, I could do it better than you could ever do. I'm done, and now I'm going to give it right back to you. <laughs> Don't worry, he's going to become a banker, and he'll be able to take care of your money for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
your most ins uh, the question again, right? Yeah, I know, I know, but yeah, I got, I got it, but okay. I can't think of the most. I, I can't think of one time, but when we first, when this first movement first got started, um, and so many events were beginning to happen, and uh, there was such a rush, and there were so many really good artists painting together for the first time. Um, now, you're talking about the movement. The Can movement, the plein air movement. The, the new plein air movement. The new plein air movement. Mm -hmm. When okay. it began to really uh, explode, and I was living close to Ray and Peggy, and we had uh, Kathleen Dumphy, and we had Chuck Waldman, and we'd get together every Friday, and we'd, we'd paint. Um, and, and, and things began to expand, and the Hagen Museum in Stockton, which is a wonderful small museum if you ever get a chance. It's got one of the finest collections of 19th century French and American academic and um, uh, un, un, uh, and, and landscape painting, 12 beer stats and that kind of thing. Um, as we uh, began to work, they sponsored shows. And we did shows from Yosemite and various places and we did a show called Sea de I'm leading some. Um, we, we, we did a show called See the Shining Sea after 9-11. Um, it was our answer to, um, and Peggy and Ray were part of it, it was our answer to, um, to, to the destruction and it was our way of contributing to the healing of the nation. And um, we put the, it took us two years to put it together and it was traveling the country, it went to 12 museums. And by the way, there are some of the artists here, I think about Michael, who could have easily been in that. I just didn't know them at that time. You know, we, um, even Ken Oster, I hadn't known yet. But in, in, in that regard, um, we, I was in, the show traveled to 12 museums and I was, I had the privilege of going to the last museum, which was the Cape Cod Museum of Art. And there were 50 artists and we'd worked in three different locations in the country and we had started at ground zero um, and just all went to observe it and then we went up the Hudson River and we painted. And I was in, in the Cape Cod Museum and a woman next to me said, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Who, who organized this? And I, was, I didn't say anything. I, I just kind of went, oh. Because it was the most beautiful show and it was such a closure on, uh, on what we as artists are trying to do because we, we know that the work, um, can I go on with this a little bit? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, um, we, look what the world feeds on. Let's see. We've had a few months of, 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 of divisiveness. But I remember one episode of the show 24. And Jack, of course, is going to save the world. And uh, in order, because there's a nuclear device that's going to go off, but he knows that the mafia has um, the information he needs. So, and they have a vendetta out on somebody. So what he does is he invites the guy that they have the vendetta on into his office, shoots him in the head, <laughs> puts his head in a bowling bag, and takes it to the mafia in order to exchange it for the information he needs. This was my first clue that we're, we're, we're feeding on S-H-I-T as, as, as a culture. And you can see what's going on. You can see what's going on by the way things have deteriorated. And what I'm saying here is that if these are inspired artists who love beauty, and it's everything. If you're an artist, it's everything. And it, it's the truth, because it's all around us, and it's been here for, for millennia. And so if we, focusing on that kind of beauty um, transforms our, ourselves and our, our fellow people, fellow humans, and it's a very important thing both appreciating and doing art. So I answered the question sort of, sort of. But I wanted to get that in because 
want to be president. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of saying, make America great again. <laughs> make America great again. Well, you know, a, a fellow that I got to meet some years back, his name is Robert Abbott, or Bob Abbott, you probably know him. Uh, he's, he's down in San Juan somewhere, he's got a, a, a he, it's a studio, but it's a compound, he does everything, he, does, he paints and he has sculpture, and, you know, his big motto is, art is going to save the planet, mm -hmm. and, and I like to think that there is a saving grace in art, that we, if we just recognize it, and we embrace it as human beings, not just as artists, but as fellow human beings, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that statement. Mm -hmm. And um, at least it should be the, one of the key contributing factors. Indeed. Yeah, it yeah, certainly it, is. And, and recognize beauty for what it is. I mean, that's, you know, and it's all around us. If we just open our eyes, instead of looking at our cell phones and texting like, you know, we all do from time to time, and some of us to, to excess, unfortunately. And, and uh, okay, I'm getting off my soapbox now. <laughs> my turn. All right, let's, let's let the Roberts answer this one uh, about your, your most inspiring moments. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I, I, I've told anybody interested that I'm, I'm always eternally grateful to Gil for putting on that show and including Peggy and myself for that. That was that was just amazing. Um, yeah. That was that was a tough time. I I have to say that that most inspiring moment. Is that, is that right. right. Yeah. Every time I go outside and I take notice of, of, of nature I'm just completely odd by it, to tell you the truth. It's it's every time I go out, I'm out in the, um, I, I'll be ping along the coast and I go, oh, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. I want a place right here. And then, and then I'm out in the desert. I go, oh, no, I want a place right here. So every time I go out, it's 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 like a a brand new experience to me for some reason. I, I and it seems like it's always overwhelming the the previous experience. Um, so it's yeah. an ongoing thing with you. It is an ongoing thing, but thank you, Gil. But I, I found out uh, after the fact that it was uh, Gil and John Cosby, John had, Cosby yeah. had actually uh, they 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 um, received they, they put together some funds together for for the catalog, and they came up short. And it was it was Gil and John that that pitched in their own private money to to make it happen. Yeah, you know, so yeah, I don't was, remember that, but I know it found them with that bank account. Now I don't know what that bank account. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? When you have one of those events, and a lot of you who are us here have have had this experience, you look over there and you say, "Oh my gosh, look who I'm painting! Look who I'm painting with! Oh, look at that! There's John Buddhism. There's Matt Smith. Oh my gosh!" How did I get to be here? <laughs> and the painting so beautifully. And Buddhism, especially in this event. Oh, I didn't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll show you if you really want to see it. <laughs> and this is Eeyore. So he's so <laughs> beautiful. And he's like, oh, John, do you get the car and just go back to San Bernardino? It's just, they're so gorgeous, and the privilege of, of, of working with the quality of people that are here this week is, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's just such a joy. So. Peggy, do you have anything you want to add to this? There is nothing else I can add. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, every time I see my friends and uh, contemporaries work, museums. It, it's just an ongoing thing. Every time I see, I come in here and see this work. I see the show at the auction. I see the show, uh, you know, as I said, friends works, contemporaries. Uh, Facebook is a constant inspiration. Just every day. 
Here we go. Well, this is very inspiring to, to hear you know, all of you. I, I remember last year, Obermeyer had a little thing about $25. That was uh, uh, some inspiration that we were talking about. And if you ever want to know the answer to that one, go check it out. There's a Facebook video somewhere in the archives of La Baba. Is that how much you got for your first painting? Uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> so I did think of something. I did pass because I, w I drew a blank when you asked that question. And Michael had such a great answer. And I'm like, I don't know. Is there a single inspirational moment ever in anybody's life? But maybe there is for some people, but for me, not. I'm, I think I agree with you guys. It's, it's a moment to moment, day by day. Some days are better than others. Um, but in 2003, I did take my first road trip all by myself. I had young boys, and I left them with their dad, and I got, got in my car and, and took 2000, a class. 2000, 2003. Uh -huh. And uh, took a class with Ann Templeton. And that was my first exposure to that group of people who do the plein air and who are, who are all, like, I feel like you guys are all that family. And I got exposed to wonderful artists who were taking the class, and Anne was great. Um, and just being in the Southwest, I think that inspired me uh, to want to be in the Southwest more than in the Midwest. <laughs> so that's pretty much the long and short of it. Cool. Well, the follow-up. Any, anybody want to ranch, say anything? Yeah, Ghost Ranch. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, the follow-up question to this is, uh, what was the most fearful or terrifying moment in your artistic career? Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, let's hear it. No. It was like talk too much. day before yesterday. Oh, day before yesterday. <laughs> I, I was... Out there in the microphone. Park. Give them the mic. There you go. I was in the park and I, I looked. I, um, Cindy ba Bauer was next to me, and I said, "I my hand is shaking. I haven't done this for seven years." And then it's, I'm utterly terrified when I go into a, a, a live auction and my work is going to be put up there in front of everybody, and I'm thinking to myself, and I know you guys made more money on it than than you did on silent auctions. But um, that's terrifying to me, and I'm, you know, I've I've been through a lot of crap. <laughs> but yesterday it was really really hard for me. So I'll give it to Ray. Okay. <laughs> What terrifies you about that blank canvas or that blank piece of paper? What is it? What is it that you need? What, 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 what does, okay, where does that lead you? Uh, the first mark and uh, possibly working without some sort of plan, but uh, just, um, I, I guess just the fear of failure. Uh, of yeah. The fear of failure and uh, time spent and unhappy and not uh, not getting a little further the next time, a little further the next time. Maybe that uh, hitting, uh, fearful of staying on a plateau for too long. But just that, just that piece of paper every every time is. Um, I want to say something new. I my greatest fear is, is uh, not saying something new. Let's, let's, let's let Mike answer this one too. Uh, he's on the far end here. 
Do you have any thoughts on this one, Mike? Yeah. I just want to add yeah, that ahead. I've done a lot of demos, and those are <laughs> the scariest. Especially when you do a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking for you. I don't know if you ever do them oh, before. Oh, yeah. No, no. Uh, there, there's a function called the plein air convention where you have 700 people watching you demo oh. <laughs> um, I'm going to agree with Gil on that one I mean yesterday um, was probably my most terrifying terrifying moment as a planner painter. I've had different terrifying moments as a production designer working at DreamWorks as a you know, presenting work to the studio, but as far as plein air painting uh, goes, this is the first time I've ever done a plein air event. Oh. So, um, it, I thought my most terrifying moment was when I came to orientation and I showed up late because I was, you know, in traffic, and I, that was terrifying enough. <laughs> um, but it, Laguna Beach can do that to you, it, it, <laughs> Coral Pipe can do that, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it really wasn't until um, I got on that trolley and I'm looking at all the artists who are on that trolley with me and, and then they're unloading this at the beach. I'm thinking, I'm going to do um, an hour and a half-ish painting, you know, with some of the, you know, the masters of my time and I'm painting with these people on a beach. Um, yeah, that terrified me, you know. And then um, the silent option to follow was just, you know, Gilding the lily on terrifying. <laughs> um, yes, but don't you know that a lot of us were looking over at you and saying, "I gotta compete with him." <laughs> uh, your your gouaches are. I mean, look at look at that gouache and, and look at and, and look at Peggy's. She said she's terrified. That's a fantastic little painting. you you know you over, yeah. terror yeah. terror is part of the process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, thank you for that, by the way. But yeah, it's like Peggy said as well. I mean, uh, the white canvas is terrifying because um, I know that most of the learning doesn't come from my successful paintings. I mean, it, it comes from my failures, unfortunately, you know, so that way I can learn from it and, and do something about it, hopefully, on the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 paintings. Um, that you look at that canvas and you're thinking, oh gosh, I have to go through something to get through the next level, you know, unless I want to be a camper of a painter and just uh, um, stagnate, you know, in the realm of uh, the same paintings and no success, you know, like, like muscle training, you have to work something to failure in order for growth to happen. Um, and in painting, that is a real terrifying moment that you know that at some point, you know you're going to challenge yourself, you know, you know that it's not going to be enough, and you know you want something different, you want an experience that was different from the last time, so that could be also pretty terrifying as well. Well, it's obvious listening to these fine people talk about their their fears and inspirations that we're not going to, along the line of Thomas Kincaid, where we're going to see your stuff on napkins and placemats and, you know, that what kind of... What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Anybody want to add anything else to this? To this? particular line of questioning about terrifying moments? Okay. The next question that I have is, is kind of, it's, it's, it's not an exciting question, but I think it's important for people to understand what made you choose your medium that you work in, and are you committed to just that one medium? Oil painting. Um, when I was a kid, I thought that was the only really legitimate paint to use. <laughs> Um, because my grandma was an oil painter, and, and I, it just, that was what I thought was the medium that real, real artists did. You know, I did paint in watercolor as a kid, um, because it was more friendly when you're young to do that. Um, but to me, I just felt like oils were, were the thing that the masters did, so I, I wanted to do, I wanted to be the real deal. Um, right. But I don't think that's true. I mean, so what do you do now? Well, I paint with oil, and yeah. because I, but I also, I also um, respect and honor and see the 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 joy of watercolor. The, I've just seen some amazing watercolor paintings that are really fun to look at, and it's it's completely opposite of oils in that it's transparent, and so it's a whole different set of challenges. And I love the expressiveness of that of of watercolor. So, um, an acrylic, um, liquid plastic, 
That's come in handy at times. <laughs> um, so, so for me, I guess it's just I, I had a prejudice. Okay. With, you know, yeah, yeah. With it, and and um, in my college education, I got to do everything: sculpture, ceramics, uh, printmaking. All we got to do all of that stuff, and I still, still wanted to do oil painting because it's just anyway. That's it. Um, I started out as an oil painter. Uh, uh, my art center days, uh, I took over a class, I took over the landscape painting class um, once I graduated, uh, and I taught it in oil. Um, and some of the first paintings I ever did for the California Art Club were big 24 by 36, big oil paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at some point in the class, um, I started uh, teaching with gouache, because I started using it as my medium since I was working as a, a full-time, uh, I was working full-time in the uh, um, animation industry, okay. you know, production design industry, and you know, it didn't really allow for a lot more of that time to oil paint, the setup, the cleanup. Right. So the gouache came in handy. Um, the students took to it, which was interesting. I noticed when I was teaching with the gouache, the students asked if they could try it. Uh, and I noticed that, um, um, they, uh, they picked up on learning techniques I was trying to get them to learn in oil without um, uh, the frustration of the medium itself. You know, with oil in and of itself, they weren't learning color, value, edge control, uh, um, because they were struggling with the application of oil. Uh, and I noticed that when I gave them gouache, for some reason, it still had its challenges, but it wasn't like the oil. You know, there was a few things that were a little bit more straightforward, uh, and they learned faster. Um, so for myself, I figured, well, you know, I'm going to learn along with them and I'm going to continue to do what I do on the side because the cleanup time is easy, the size is small. I needed to be able to get out and do paintings within 45 minutes because I would only, I would paint whenever I had a break at work or I'd paint after work or before work since it wasn't really my full-time job to be a plein air painter. Uh, but I kind of hated gouache. I mean, I hated it, you know, for the most part because I, I started out as an oil painter because the colors in oil are so rich. Uh, they're beautiful, they're lush, um, and uh, the buildup is fantastic. And with the gouache, you know, there were so many things about it that it just, it was kind of matte, didn't dry dark enough, or when you wanted a light color, it dried darker, you know, it's just this thing. Mm -hmm. I, I learned, you know, it's this relationship, it's a love-hate relationship with it. I've learned to kind of understand, you know, how it works and why it works and whatnot, but I'm not exclusive to it, it's just that I've, I've become so intimate with the medium because I've used it for over 25 years now that I I, um, I understand what it is it wants to do and what it wants to become and I found a way to imitate oil painting with it. Um, but I'm not exclusive to the gouache. I mean, at some point I do want to start getting back into oil painting and going bigger in size as well. So it's not... Is gouache a limitation on size? Yeah. Um, because? For me, gouache is definitely a limitation on size. I mean, I... I Comfortably like to paint within you know six by nine eight by ten is comfortable one because I use it like an oil I build it up um, For anyone who's ever used it, you know a little tube of white paint is like twelve dollars yeah. mm -hmm. And in a series three it's like twenty five thirty dollars, so mm -hmm. you tend not to want to spread it so thick <laughs> um, And it doesn't spread and it doesn't move like oil does on campus and I, I remember I did a I did a, a recent workshop at Umqua um, in Oregon and I did a, a demo on 8x10, and uh, I remember finishing the demo in about uh, 20 minutes because the oil just spread so fast. Now we're saying, I gotta get back into oil again <laughs> um, uh, because of the economy of it. But you know, once I started painting in oil again, I started kind of you know, missing my, that abusive relationship I have with Wash. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> she kind of calls to me on that way. Um, so, it, it, but it's something I think what's useful for me about it is I, I've learned to use it like an oil paint. So, I, uh, it's nice for me to maybe use it as you know in the future as studies before doing bigger paintings, getting out in the field and nailing maybe the color and the light, and then into the studio work doing the bigger oils as well, or plein air out in the field. So, I look forward to returning to the oil medium. Okay, interesting. Let's, let's let the Roberts chime in on this one. Um, I love it all. I just, uh, I love gouache. I worked 
with it um, as an illustrator and uh, I came back to it. I love oils. I just um, I love the versatility of it. I love transparent watercolor. I love ceramics. I love pen and ink. Uh, just and um, I have as a, long as it covers that white canvas or paper, right? <laughs> yes. Is that it? And I, yeah, I, I just, I love it all, and I've tried it all, and I have bodies of work in it all, and, and I'm just a very curious person that way. Is there anything that you're particularly fond of working on today? Since you were talking about the last six years being a kind of a turning point in your, in your artistic expression. Well, I started doing some more ceramics, and um, I've been working fairly exclusively in gouache for the past couple years, except for when I teach. It's, um, I'm teaching more in it, but I usually teach in oils. And um, so, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Uh, about 12 years ago, I tuned into NPR. Uh, we get an NPR station in the Angels Camp, and, and uh, I couldn't believe it. They, they had this artist on from Stockton, and his name was Gil Dillinger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on NPR? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, he was there. <laughs> yes, and they asked you all about your crayons. Crayons? Crayons. <laughs> Uh, or, uh, I, uh, when I, my first oil painting I did, I, uh, I immediately fell in love with the luster that you get from the painting. It's just such a lively, fluid medium that that's really difficult to get in any of the others. I mean, you can get it with watercolor. I struggled with gouache. I, I love all mediums. I, I love a well done painting, no matter how it's done. But um, Oils. I'm an oil guy. Love, love, love a well done oil painting. I can't use oils um, because, in, I, in, seriously, in the '60s, I, I'm lucky I'm alive, um, and it, I think I destroyed some brain cells. <laughs> and oil really affects me. So I found myself getting very irritable whenever I used it, even if I used water-based oils. So I, pref I uh, worked for 12 years. Pastel, and that's a pastel. Um, um, uh, that's a gouache in the middle, and that's a crow. And one of the reasons why I do that is because I'm deathly afraid of becoming boring or be being bored. And by changing mediums in order to uh, master something new always keeps, keeps my ideas fresh. And when I saw uh, Mike's a gouache, oh, maybe six weeks ago. I went out and bought gouache. I thought these these are stunning, and I and of course I've always admired Peggy's gouache. So I've been I've, I've been working in gouache on location. Um, I use a black ground, which is very strange, but it it uh, it does build up light so magnificently. I do use a little bit of acrylic um, clear gesso with it because it creates a tooth. That, um, and, the, and the first layer doesn't pick up into the second. So, and I discovered that by accident. And then it, it, it will form, when we, if I use clear gesso with the gouache, it will form a wonderful surface to do, to do a pastel over. Mm -hmm. So the painting I did today on location is 2436 out of Heisler, and I underpainted it with, uh, with gouache. Clear gesso. And then overpainted with what? Pastel. With it's pastel. A pastel. That is fascinating. So you use com two completely different media. Yeah, but one, because of the, the gouache is matte, you, a lot of the gouache shows through. Right. And you can't tell the difference. And pastel is the only medium I've ever been able to use where I created the kind of light I wanted. The kind of um, uh, transparent light or the kind of. Like, uh, if, yeah, if, if 
that one on the on the upper left that's that's that is a pastel yeah. and if people look at that they say that's a pastel yeah yeah, it's like, yeah. so yeah, I, I have a, a, an acrylic underpainting using using the um, clear gesso to, to create the surface that takes the pastel like a dream so anybody it, taking notes here <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll be working in that way most of the week. If you find me, I'll be glad to show you about it. That's fascinating. I have a question. Please. Um, that one right over there with the rock, is that... Uh, that's an acrylic. That's an acrylic. That's an on-site acrylic from down at the... Iceland. Iceland. It's beautiful. Those masses of rock. Are, but there, I, I did a lot of layering with, um, with acrylic medium building and then picking up and doing some glazing and that kind of thing. Well, I have one last question, and we're going to try to keep this very short. I'm not trying to try to play, uh, you know, uh, moderator here, but based on your experiences, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to follow the path of becoming an artist? If someone said to you, I'm thinking of being an artist, just like you, what would you tell them? Good luck. <laughs> but why? <laughs> and one of you guys all would have said the same thing. Um, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess what I have told young people, especially if they, they're, they want to be an artist when they grow up or they're working toward it or whatever. It's all about your attitude and your work, your, your desire and your ambition, um, that that is actually even more important than your talent. I mean, talent helps or, or your ability to make a nice painting or do, do the work you love, but you have to, you have to keep a positive attitude and, and know you can do it because if you have this desire and you go around saying, well, I love to paint, but I know I can't make a living at it. Uh, I really, uh, uh, nobody will ever buy it. Uh, you know, then you're doing a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, I always tell them to really, you know, it's work hard, keep a positive attitude, do what you love, and, and take it from there. <laughs> it is the last question. It it's okay. Exactly what Shelby said. And I have taught for so long, and I get so many, um, all ages, all uh, levels of artists in my workshops, and there's so many of them that want it so badly. At, at many at many ages, and I have seen the success stories of someone maybe not starting till they're in their 70s. And exactly what Shelby said is how how bad do you want it? Can you? you uh, unfortunately, there are, you know many groups that get trapped in other people's formats. So that's a learning process of uh, making the tools your own. But um, how bad do you want it? How hard are you willing to work? And the positive attitude. And researching that it's just not selling a painting from a wall that helps you make a living. There's just tons of venues of making a living as a creative person. Anything you want to add, Ray? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, gosh, I don't know if there's anything I can add to that. Um, uh, is it, the, the common question is, is, is it talent or is it hard work that, or perseverance that, that, that makes a person, um, gets them ahead as an artist and, and I, I, I think it's just interest. If, if you have the desire and the interest in it, you, you will find a way. And um, I would not go with the hard work or the 
or the talent. I would, I would go with the interest and desire. Yeah. Passion. Yeah. Uh, first thing I would say to, to a, a person would be learn to draw and learn to draw and learn to draw. Right. And draw the figure and draw and draw and draw and draw. That's the first thing I would say. And if you love that, you know, then you may, might be in a, um, a position to go forward. Um, I would also say, uh, doesn't uh, selling a painting is not. It, it's great. It's nice comfort. It helps, but it isn't the reason. The reason has to be because you have something to say and you you, you can't not say it. Um, and be willing to work so hard that you, you, your skin has to be so tough that if somebody bit you, you wouldn't even feel it. <laughs> You're just, you, you, because people are going to hate what you do. Your parents or your, I have one young woman in my class, her, she's of East Indian descent, and, and she, her parents are furious with her for being, wanting to be an artist. And she wants to be an artist, and she's going to be an artist. And she, she, that, that's the kind of courage I think you have to have. So, um, and, oh, I'll just tell you one more thing. I, I know I've talked a lot. When I, was, I was in my studio. When I first became an, an artist, and I got a job at American <coughs> College in Sacramento because I was the only one who could draw um, who was in a, in a sabbatical, for a sabbatical replacement. And I had said to myself, I want to be famous artist by the time I'm 30. I mean, that's a young person's um, stupidity. But I, I, I was right on the 30. Um, but it was 30 years. <laughs> 30 years before anybody even knew I was there. I, I think that there was that wonderful Bob Seger song, um, 20 years, where'd it go? And I was in... Uh, um, 20 years, I don't know. Um, I was in my studio when I heard that, and I just, I, I'd been working about 20 years, and I just wept. Because nobody knew who I was or what I was doing. And I think that you have to have an awful lot of faith in yourself if you want to be really good, and you have to be patient. And, 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 uh, and God will help. Yeah. If you have that kind of passion, that kind of love, you'll get help. Because Beauty is important. It's really important. Mike, anything you want to add to this? Um, I, I couldn't agree more with the, what everybody has said here tonight. I mean, um, I had to pass on that for a second because I had to re uh, reflect on uh, what I teach as an instructor. You know, because I get that that question is asked all the time. You know, students want to know. They're starving for what you know the answer. And you know, and and. I know that you know for them they're looking for procedure. You know, well, you know when you take a class A plus B equals C, but with what's going on here, A plus B doesn't equal C. You know, it doesn't, and you don't want it to, because um, it's all about honesty. You know, the honesty behind the artist. I guess the best advice I could ever give, you know, which is advice I give myself, um, and I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, we're all trying to figure this out as we go. But the best advice I would have is to try and take a risk. Uh, paint outside your comfort zone. Um, for me, you know, I know that I, I had a tendency to paint the same subject matter and the same type of lighting, the same composition, because it was comfortable. I, I knew I could do it, so I would go and I'd say, okay, well, I know that I can do the backlit lighting on the ocean and shores because it was simplified, and I'd aim to do that every single time. When I turned around and looked the other way and I looked at a city scene, I'd say, no, I don't, don't want to do that. That's just not me. And I would tell myself that's not me, but was it not me or was it because I was afraid or I was insecure or I was undeveloped? Um, so I made it a point, you know, to, to look at those things and say, okay, well, that's what I need to focus on, the things that I don't want to do. Not because it's not within the realm of what interests me, but it's because it's something I have an insecurity with that I haven't been able to do before. Um, so I would make it a point to paint the things that I would probably not want to paint. Um, and if you wanted to paint it, well, you make a focus on it. If it's buildings you can't do, you go and you paint buildings until you you can paint the buildings. Um, you know, and if it's uh, if it's mountains, well, then you paint and you take classes and you you know you uh, go for the workshops and everything that you can for the people who paint the mountains the best and 
you learn how to do them. Um, so for me, I continue to try to challenge myself and paint outside my comfort zone uh, because there's a tendency to stay comfortable. And, and you got to be careful because sometimes it could be mistaken for your favorite subject matter. And I know there's certain things that I gravitate towards and I say, okay, I love to paint this and that's different. But then I have to really pay attention to my soul and know whether or not I'm gravitating more towards something because the other stuff is more complicated and it's outside or do I really not want to do it? So it's kind of a, um, a juggle that I, I constantly challenge myself with and trying to find a way to paint outside the realm of what I'm used to until I can become used to it. And at some point, you'll know whether or not you, you want it. But you should be able to at least do it and then decide whether or not you don't want to do it. But don't walk away from it because you can't do it. You know, Decide, okay, well, it was something I was able to do. Now I know what I really like to do. But I think that would be my best advice for anybody would be the challenge. Yeah, it's interesting hearing all of these really very deep, soul-searching answers. Um, and I'm, I'm really quite surprised uh, not surprised, but actually quite, quite inspired listening to all of you talk. I, as a gallerist, when people come to me and they look at the work that's on the walls and they come inside here, and, you know, the one thing I tell people is that what you're looking at, you're looking at a window into somebody's soul. This is not just a painting. This is someone who put something into or onto a uh, a piece of canvas or paper or whatever it is and it's a window into who they are and you're not just buying this 24 by 30 piece of work you're buying someone's a part of someone's life that they put into this piece and people look at me sometimes with a you know like, really <laughs> and it's yeah because they don't just do this because they're just churning out art for art's sake or to make a uh, to make a quick buck. I mean, what we have on these walls in this gallery is, this is real, honest to God, people's souls on these canvases and on these pieces of paper. And this is amazing. When you are able to look at a piece of work and figure out or try to figure out what's going on in this artist's head when they're putting this piece of work together and what they're expressing. That's to me is the magic of art. And, and I think, you know, if we can all instill that into, people, into people's appreciation, I think we're coming a little further in life. I thank you all. I think you did a wonderful job. with us to, uh, for this event because um, he had to have hip surgery. He's watching live right now. It's Richard Lindenberg. Oh, so if you could all yeah, say yeah, hi, yeah, Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we miss him very much. Yeah. And he'll be here next year. Wish you were here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll do a quick Q&A for five minutes and let everybody, you know, have an opportunity to ask questions. Please. I have a question for Peggy. Peggy, I was so, um, when you said that your mom was a high, high in-demand fashion illustrator, and to me, fashion illustration is so, like, intricately detailed, which is, in my eye at least, is kind of opposite of your work, and I'm curious how that trans, like, what did you take from, I'm assuming when you were growing up watching your mom do what she did, it seems very different from what you do. Um, not, not really. Uh, there are all levels of fashion illustration mm -hmm. where the high-end fashion, they're just very loose. It's, it's really not even suggesting a specific garment more than an attitude and uh, a, a gown or just a feeling of fabric. And then, yes, there are very intricate, uh, more detailed, say, if you worked for a department store and you were rendering jewelry or um, um, lingerie, lace, things like that. And everyone, or uh, I worked for a while where I was the soft, I was 
called the soft line artist. I did all the floating underwear and <laughs> clothes. And the other staff artist was the, was the hard line. He was drawing um, lawn mowers and, and uh, rakes or, you know, that department. So there were all levels and styles and you just Google fashion illustration and you'll see, uh, you know, some of my fr Fred Greenhill and it was just illustrating more of a feeling and attitude. So, um, but um, she did love that about it in, in that uh, she was, um, did a lot of sweaters and just loved the intricacy of it. And I'm, a, I'm just a little more, um, I guess I like more the attitude. Yeah. Any other questions that people have for the, for the artists here? Please. For your first question, I'd be curious to, about is the person that received being, being artistic and being an artist. Well, is it asking me the question? Yeah. Well, you know, we all come to a point where we have to do something that is either uh, it's an expression. We have to express ourselves somehow. You know, artistic expression could take on a lot of forms. It could be it could be the the, the written word. It could be uh, you know pen on paper, it could be paint. Um, music is another form. I, I, music is an art. I mean, art is music. Uh, it's, so I, I think, you know, the question was, when did you first discover that you were artistic? And it didn't necessarily have to be putting a brush on a canvas. And that's what led into the question of, when did you want to become a professional artist? So that's kind of a step that I wanted to take with that. Questions? Anybody? If not, I would say thank you for being here tonight. This was a wonderful, I think this was an amazing night. You guys were fabulous.